Welcome to lesson number 11 in general revelation. We're talking about what is going to happen in the future. We've already covered uh, several different topics of this. We started in the Old Testament and then we began looking at some of the first events of the tribulation period and now we're getting towards the end of the tribulation period. In this lesson, we want to talk about a battle that's found in Ezekiel chapter 38, and I've just labeled it the Ezekiel battle. And then we'll look at the last event of the tribulation, which is the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Our passage is found in Ezekiel chapter 38. Let me read several verses. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And on down to verse 5, it talks of other nations, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them. And thus we see several of these various nations, and this map can kind of give you an idea of where these various nations are, the land of, of Magog up uh, to the north, uh, likely uh, Russia, that kind of area, uh, Meshach and Tubal, this is uh, modern day Turkey, uh, and then we've got L Libya, Cush, Put, uh, all of these, Persia, these nations are all involved in this battle that we are calling the Ezekiel battle. Jump down to verses 11 and 12. And you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest and live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates, to capture spoil and to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired cattle and goods who live in the center of the world. There are two points I want to make in this, these two verses. The first is that Israel is at a time of peace, a time of rest. Uh, the, the unwalled villages would mean that their defense system is, is let down, that they, they do not have walls, they're living securely. And certainly that does not describe Israel today as basically every nation around Israel uh, is uh, anti-Israel, almost every nation, so many, some even wanting to annihilate uh, Israel. And so they're certainly not at peace or at rest. They're not living securely in unwalled cities today. Also, the second thing I want to point out is the purpose of this invasion. It says in verse 12 that they, their desire is to capture spoil, to seize plunder. In other words, uh, they want to, to ransack the nation and to take the wealth of the nation. That's their goal their, of this battle. Then in chapter 39, verses 1 to 3, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I shall turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel, and I shall strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. Hopefully you recognize the emphasis that I made on the various personal pronouns. It's God himself. He's saying that it is I who am against you, that I will turn you around. I, God, shall strike your bow, your, your weapons. 
So, the question comes to our mind. What battle is this? What's he talking about? Uh, some might say that this Ezekiel battle is the same as the Battle of Armageddon that we talked about in the last lesson. The Battle of Armageddon was where the various nations of the world gather together. Uh, the Antichrist, the beast, uh, gather at the Mount of Megiddo, and they are trying to annihilate in the Armageddon Israel. Now, there are several differences between this Ezekiel battle and the Arm Battle of Armageddon. First, there's a difference in allies. In the Ezekiel battle, God gives definite allies, certain nations that are mentioned. Well, in the Battle of Armageddon, all nations are engaged. It says in Joel 3.2, talking about Armageddon, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And thus, uh, there seems to be a very stark difference in the various nations that are involved. In Ezekiel, there are specific individual nations that are named where the Battle of Armageddon is all nations that are gathered together. There's also a difference in the origin. The Ezekiel battle comes from the north. Notice in Ezekiel 38, verses 5 and 6, Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all its troops, and Beth to Garmoth. Now here's from the far north with all its troops. So the, this battle is going to be uh, confronted, com coming down from the north. Well, the Battle of Armageddon, the, the, the whole earth, uh, they're coming from the north, from the south, from the east. They're converging on Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. But in this battle, it, the origin of the attacks is coming from the north. Also, the goal of the battle, I, I mentioned this somewhat already. It says, Gog comes to take spoil. Uh, I will plunder and loot, it says in Ezekiel 38, 12, uh, where in the battle of Armageddon, the nations assemble to destroy the people of God. There's a difference in that the battle in Ezekiel, some nations protest this battle. They speak against it. Uh, in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13, it says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, Have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off the silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? In other words, there's, there's a questioning of their motives. There's a, uh, as if a, a rebuke of these nations that are coming against Israel. But in Armageddon, there are no protests as all the nations are joined against Jerusalem. Also, the leader of these two battles, Gog is said to be the head of the armies, but in Armageddon, the beast is the head of the invasion. In Revelation 19:19, 19, 19, it says, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. Also, in uh, the uh, battle of Ezekiel, God calls for assist assistance in executing judgment uh, on Gog. He says, I will call for a sword against him. He's asking for help. Uh, where the sword in the battle of Armageddon is while Jesus himself comes with a sword and with his army. So there seem to be uh, extreme differences between these two battles. So we might then want to ask, when is this Ezekiel battle going to take place? There are several uh, options that have been presented. Some would say that it's prior to the rapture, and some of my favorite theologians believe this, but I see it. There's, there's a problem with this because if that is true, then it would mean that the rapture is not imminent. 
Uh, by that, we mean that the rapture could happen at any time. There is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture could take place. But if this battle has to happen before the rapture, then the rapture is no longer imminent. Some others would suggest that this is at the end of the tribulation, and that's what we basically just went through and showed that it is distinct it is different in many, many ways from the Battle of Armageddon, so it's not that ending battle of the tribulation. Some have suggested it's at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and yet, uh, the wicked, when Jesus returns, are destroyed, they're judged. And so, at the beginning of the millennium, there are no enemies uh, left uh, when Jesus is there reigning upon the earth for a thousand years. Others say it's at the millennium, at the end of the millennium. However, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see this battle, but then in Ezekiel 40 through 48, it goes on to talk about the millennium. So it seems that the millennium follows this battle. Therefore, I think the best interpretation of when the Ezekiel battle takes place is that it will take place during that 70th week of Daniel, during the tribulation time. Now, just exactly when during the tribulation, it could be somewhere around that second or third sealed judgment, somewhere towards the beginning or middle. Uh, we don't know just exactly when, but it it seems that Israel is living in a time of peace. With They feel that there's no need for walls around their cities. They're at rest. And that seems the, that first, uh, when the covenant is made with Israel, that they will be at peace. And that first seal judgment uh, seems to be a time of peace. But then war and famine come following that. And it would seem best that this battle would take place sometime in that point. So that takes us to our second topic for this lesson, which is the last event of the seven years of tribulation, which is the literal return of Christ to this earth. What I want to do is I want to read one of the main verses that depict Christ's return. So I want you to look at this picture as to how this artist tried to represent uh, Jesus' return to this earth. It's found in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. I saw a white horse. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a, a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. It's a description of the second coming of Christ. But it's not just in Revelation where we see this. There are many verses in Scripture that talk of the second coming of Christ. In Matthew 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And a passage I will mention several times, Acts 1, 11, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And Paul in Philippians 3, 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So the second coming has a very strong biblical uh, basis. So I want to look at some of the characteristics of this return. What is it going to be like? First, it is personal. Uh, in John 14, 3, it says, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So these first person pronouns, as Jesus is speaking, he is saying that I, myself, I uh, will come again. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, it says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. So it's not just that the Lord will descend from heaven, that, that is strong enough, but it's emphasizing. It's Jesus, Jesus himself. Uh, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And then our passage in Acts 1.11, again, uh, the angels said that Jesus is going to return in the same way that he went up. It was personal. Uh, he was a personal being. Secondly, he was a physical uh, being that, uh, that is going to return. This Acts 1.11, Jesus, when he went up, he was in his body uh, so that when Christ re returns, it will be in his physical body. Now, right now, Christ is with us through the Holy Spirit in Matthew 28, 20, and John 14, 3, Colossians 1, 27. Surely, Christ is with us today, but not in a personal, physical form. Uh, and the second coming, we'll see Christ in his physical body coming back uh, just as they saw him taken up into the clouds as he was walking with them and talking with them. And they watched as he arose and went up and was taken up into the clouds. He's going to come back in that same way. Also in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. It's talking of a physical return. It's not talking about Christ reigning uh, spiritually in our bodies. Uh, that's certainly taking place today. This is a personal, physical, and it is a visible return. Again, our Acts 1.11 uh, says, in the same way that you saw him go, you're going to see it visibly, they saw it. But we can also look at Matthew 24.30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 26 and verse 64, Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. This coming, this second coming, fourthly, uh, will be triumphant and glorious. He will come back on the clouds with great power and great glory, it says in Matthew 24, 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In Mark 13, 26, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. In Luke 21, 27, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And Matthew 25, 31 to 33 tells us how he will sit in judgment on the, on the throne. Verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his rights and the goats on his left. So Christ's return is he will personally, physically, visibly, and triumphantly come from the clouds down to this earth and will reign for a thousand years. 
Now there are several other events that are taking place during this time. We'll just briefly uh, mention them. The beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. You found that in Revelation 19 and verse 20. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image, the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That will take place at the second coming of Christ. But not just the beast and the false prophet, even Satan himself is going to be bound. It says in Revelation 20 and verse 2, he sees the dragon, that's the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him. For a thousand years. There's also a resurrection that is going to take place at the second coming of Christ. The saints of the Old Testament are going to be resurrected from the grave. Uh, their souls have been in heaven uh, since the ascension of Christ, but now they will be reunited with their bodies, much like the New Testament believers at the rapture. In Daniel 12, 2, it says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Isaiah 26, verse 19 and 20. But your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up, shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Go, my people. Enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath has passed by. Now, these Old Testament believers are going to be resurrected along with the tribulation saints. We see that in Revelation 20 and verse 4. I saw the thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life. Their bodies are raised for a thousand years to reign with Christ. There's two judgments that are going to take place. The Jews are going to be judged in Ezekiel 20. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will rule over you with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you into the desert of the nations and there face to face I will execute judgment upon you as I judged your fathers in the desert of the land of Egypt. So I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. I will take note of you as you pass under my rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me, although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, and they will not enter the land of Israel. They will know that I am the Lord. Also, the Gentiles are going to be judged. It's called the judgment of the sheep and the goats, one that we're quite familiar with. It's also found in Joel uh, chapter 2. So these events are all going to be taking place at the second coming of Christ. You know, I like how C.S. Lewis uh, depicts this in Narnia, where he speaks of Aslan, the lion, returning to Narnia. And he says, I quote, Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets us death, and when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. Jesus will return to earth the second time. The first time he came as a suffering servant to die to pay the penalty for our sins. He will come the second time as a conquering warrior who will defeat evil and set up his kingdom, where he will reign with justice for a thousand years, which we will talk about 
in the next section, the millennial reign of Christ.